Hey, thank you, Larry. Larry, you are our SCWA's own unreliable narrator. <laughs> You're right. So um, thank you for um, the, the exercise in hyperbole and uh, giving Lee the great lead in. Uh, but before we, we turn it over to him, I'm just gonna um, t tell you a little bit about him. He's the author of eight novels, or I could say 15 and nobody would know the difference, right Lee? Because I can be unreliable if I want to. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I probably have about 15. There's just ones waiting in the wings. So. Yeah, well, okay, thank you. Okay, um, including The Ancestor um, and The Mentor, currently in development is a film uh, off his original script and the YA series Runaway Train. He's been published in multiple languages and nominated for the Prix de Polar, Polar, Polar? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay, we're going with that. Go with that. Um, his, uh, Stalker Stalked is currently available on Amazon. After graduating with an MFA from the new school, he appeared as a contributor in Pipeline Artists, Lit Hub, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Millions, Volume One, uh, Brooklyn, Lit Reactor, and numerous other publications. These pilots and screenplays have been finalists in Script Pipeline, Book Pipeline, Stage 32, We Play, the New York Screenplay, Screencraft, and the Hollywood Screenplay Contest. He is the co-curator of the Gorilla Lit Reading Series and lives in New York City. Um, all right, Lee, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Looking thanks, forward Maddie. to it. And yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here uh, this morning. And um, we're gonna talk about unreliable narrators because they're a lot of fun to talk about. Um, and sort of what I like to do, I used to be a professor also for 10 years. Um, I, I taught at uh, the College of New Rochelle. And when I was a professor, I always had like a, a mix of lecture and discussion. So I'd love it for that to be a part of this as well, where I'll lecture for a little bit and then we can open it up for, for, for Q&A and discussion because I feel like that, that, that's when you really get to like the interesting stuff. Um, but uh, for, to start it off, um, yeah, unreliable narrators. So I think what's so fun about unreliable narrators, especially for a lover of books like myself, I love to be shocked when I read. And I find that more than anything with an unreliable narrator, there's that shock element that's involved, whether or not you know from the start that the person is unreliable or that it's like a third act twist that ultimately kind of um, you know, jumps in and changes the whole narrative. Um, when you think about books and readers versus an author, it's almost like a contract between the two. We assume that the narrator knows what they're talking about for the most part. Um, but with an unreliable narrator, uh, it really kind of changes that atmosphere of it. Um, it's almost as if the author and the reader have to work um, twice as hard, three times as hard, um, mainly because um, they're not sure really what's gonna happen next. Um, so when you think about unreliable narrators, we're really all unreliable narrators. Um, and the reason for that is memory is a very tricky thing. Um, when we tell a story after the fact, there's no way to be able to 100% perfect with all the details. Our memories are stories where our minds fill in the gaps if we can't recall. Sometimes we exaggerate even unintentionally. Um, and when I think about this, I often think of like a memoir as a good example. I love a good memoir. Um, but when you're reading a memoir, is it really 100% all truth? Um, I have a friend, I'm not going to say the, the name or the book, but I was a chapter in a friend's memoir, and <laughs> it was mostly, mostly good. Um, but when I was reading it, what was really interesting was that there wasn't anything untrue per se, but the events that the, the, the author dictated happened sort of out of turn from what I remembered them. And when I asked them about it, they were basically like, well, yeah, it, they, I needed to do that to tell a more concise, interesting story. And it really changed my perception of when I read memoir. It, it's not necessarily that it's not true. It's just that it's not 100% reliable versus what really happened factually. Um, and oftentimes with unreliable narrators, um, that, that, that's really the case. You know, when we think about how we remember things, we don't often remember them exactly in the order that they happen. Um, I sometimes think back to really what I remember is my first memory in life. Um, my parents had rented a place on the beach in Long Island. I was two years old and there was this beautiful yellow beanbag chair that overlooked a glass porch and the beach. And I would just 
sit in this huge beanbag chair as a two-year-old and watch the sunset. And it was this sort of picture perfect image. Um, and it always, in my mind, was the first memory that I ever had. Years later, I was going through my family's photo album and I saw literally a picture of that yellow beanbag chair, a sunset, the beach and the glass porch. And it made me wonder, was I remembering the picture, seeing it later in life, or as a two-year-old, had I really, really remembered what happened? And it changed my whole perception of what I thought I once knew. Um, and memory is really a lot like that, especially when we dig back to far away things. Um, you know, if you think even of our dreams, we create stories and our mind has to plug in all the details. So we're always our best storytellers, basically, whether it's something that just happened yesterday and we exaggerate a little bit, or if it's something that happened a long time ago. And just because of the time has passed, we really have to kind of fill in all the blanks. And when we do that, we try to make it as interesting as possible. Um, you know, so when you think about off uh, narrators as well, um, you could ask the question whether a truly reliable first place person narrator actually exists or not. Um, because every character views the story through a distortion of their own biases, experiences, perspectives, personality quirks, and they tell that story through a series of omissions and carefully chosen facts. But you could also argue that there's a difference between sane, mature, well-intentioned narrators who are doing all of their best to tell you as true a remembrance as possible, and narrators who are intentionally or in unintentionally steering you through a distorted version of events for myriad of reasons. They're insane, they're immature, they're dishonest, they're egocentric, they're insecure, they're defensive, they're addicted to something, or they're basically immoral. Um, these are really the unreliable narrators that are not to be trusted, but what's so great about them is they are there to be enjoyed for the most part. Um, so let's go into what an unreliable narrator really is. Um, usually when they're talked about, there's basically four types of unreliable narrators that authors turn to. And if you're creating your own books, um, I think if you have the idea that you want to write a book with an unreliable narrator, the best way is to think first, what type of unreliable narrator do you wanna write about? Sometimes these blur the lines and they can cross over between the two, but it's really important because some of it could be intentional and some of it could be unintentional. So I think that's really the first thing you wanna think about. Um, the first example I'm gonna give, it's called a Picaro. A Picaro is basically a character who exaggerates. Um, oftentimes we've heard of a picaresque novel. A picaresque novel is, uh, when we think of like Charles Dickens, um, the encyclopedia definition of a Boccaro, it's a cynical and a moral rascal who, if given half a chance, would rather live his or her, by heart wits rather than by honorable work. The Boccaro wanders about, they have adventures among people from all social classes and professions, often just barely escaping punishment from their own lying, cheating, and stealing. So it, it's sometimes somebody pulled out of their normal kind of world and they're thrust upon this whole different one where things are changing so fast that it's almost hard for them to kind of grasp as to what's happening. Um, a good example of this is one of my favorite books, also one of my favorite uh, films as well, which is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, this could also be uh, a, a different kind of unreliable narrator, but the narrator in that is Picaro because it's a work of gonzo journalism. It's often mentioned in postmodern references to the picaresque in this episodic narrative structure because of its lack of conscious moral concerns on the part of its subjects. On the flip side, the character also is on masculine for a good chunk of it. So that maybe has something to do with it as well. Um, obviously, if somebody is inebriated, are there more are there faculties 100% there to tell you the truth of the story or are they seeing potentially a little bit of an exaggeration as to what's going on um, also the character in that he is a little bit immoral um, so is that somebody that we wholly trust 100% anyway um, whether it's the film or the book as well another good example is um, one of my another one of my favorite authors um, is Donna Tart actually at, right after I wrote up the outline, I realized one of her other books also has unreliable narrators, which is um, The Secret History. Secret History basically begins the book 
you know what happens, somebody is murdered, and then it dials back into the why and the how and the what. And through that, all of the characters we kind of trust, we don't trust, we're not sure. Um, so there's examples of unreliable narrators in that. But in terms of a Picaro, um, the Goldfinch is really an example of uh, that type of unreliable narrator. We have young Theo Decker. He was the victim of a sudden and violent attack in an art museum when he's there. A bomb explodes it, his mom. Um, and he shifted from a normal life, you know, a wealthy, um, you know, upper middle class life um, to one without rules or guidance. When you have a character that's kind of pulled at basically out of their world, like I said, and they're forced to start anew and kind of start again, um, they're already so, you know, thrown off by what happened that we can't 100% rely on them to give us 100% of what the facts are. Um, oftentimes, a lot of these books are very, very sprawling. Uh, the Goldfinch, a perfect example of that. I think it runs at like 700, 800 pages. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful novel. And you really want to trust and like the character. Um, and oftentimes, that's really important with an unreliable character, too. You want to, the author wants them to have the trust involved so the reader can go along with them from start to finish throughout the book. If we don't trust them right off the bat, um, are we necessarily going to go with them through this whole experience, especially if it's a picaresque novel that's oftentimes um, quite long? Uh, a third example that I had for that, which um, I admittedly haven't read since high school, but it's an example of a Picaro is uh, Mole Flanders by Daniel Defoe. And again, this was a trope used a lot in writers of that era. Um, I don't necessarily know 100% why, but um, I think they like to write these sort of sprawling epics. And oftentimes characters like Mole Flanders, who was born to a mother in prison, but lies about their social standing in order to wed wealthy men and inherit their money, um, we have a character whose sole interest is to move up in society, to take them from one socioeconomic status to ultimately a higher one. And in doing so, we'll do some unsavory things to get there. Sometimes some of those unsavory things is, again, not being as reliable as possible. Um, so those are a few examples of uh, the first kind of trope, which is a Picaro, which is unreliable, but I would say it's probably like the most reliable of unreliable. You probably can figure out that maybe half the time, three quarters of the time, they're going to be legit. And it's just noticing those little instances sort of here and there when they bend the truth, when they stretch the truth, or even out of their own, um, you know, even if they don't mean to be, um, they, they wind up um, exaggerating or lying. Um, so the second uh, type of unreliable narrator, it's a little bit more of um, a fun, reliable narrator, I would say. Um, and maybe that's my own twisted sense of humor, um, but that is the madman, um, the mad woman. Um, the madman, mad woman is a, a, a device used in you know, many, many books. And what's great about it is they've lost their sense of self, their sense of you know, um, understanding with connection with the world. Um, so it's kind of like no holds barred, um, anything could kind of happen in terms of how reliable they are. I think about um, one of my favorite books um, and films as well, um, which again, maybe says something about me, but um, American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, uh, which you haven't read it. Uh, you know, it's a classic 90s book. It was made into a film, Christian Bale in the late 90s as well. Um, and what's brilliant about Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho, for whatever you think about him, he's definitely a polarizing character. Um, but the main character, Patrick Bateman, He's a bored Wall Street investment banker. He's living an unhappy life of monotonous, yuppie bullshit that basically drives him uh, to a fantasy world of insanity, rape, murder, cannibalism, horrific torture via rats. Um, or it's not a fantasy and you actually believe he's truly a homicidal psychopath who wanders around in public covered in human blood and fails to get a reaction. Um, but one thing is certain, he's definitely unreliable. Uh, and what's brilliant about a book like that is um, you really don't know for a good chunk of it. And even in the film, you could kind of question at the end, I think you could come out of it thinking one thing or thinking the other thing. And I really like that, especially with um, 
my work as well, where not everything is almost tied up in a nice little bow and that's it. Depends on the reader as to how they want to take it. So I think maybe 50% of the readers could take it that he's absolutely crazy. And the other half could think that he's a murderous psychopath. Um, and that's what's so brilliant about an unreliable narrator like him. Um, another really great example is another amazingly brilliant writer from the 60s, um, and that's Ken Kesey. Um, Ken Kesey wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, amongst uh, you know, a few other really great titles. Again, it was also made into a fantastic film, um, but the book and the film are quite different. You know, the book is narrated by Chief, Bron Chief Bromden, where the movie is really Jack Nicholson's star vehicle. He's the main character. And in the book, um, the chief has seen a lot in his time. He's fought in World War II. He's witnessed the humiliation and the decline of his Native American father. He's been so ignored by those around him that people have come to believe he's basically deaf and mute, which he's really not. He just is almost neglected and um, not even seen by people. Um, and he's been locked in a mental ward for a decade. He's schizophrenic, you know, with a side of PTSD. So, you know, he's definitely, you know, in a place that he should be at, even though that place is not the best place. Um, and chock full of psychiatric meds. He suffers from hallucinations and he's paranoid about a group called the Combine, which he believes secretly runs society. Um, under normal circumstances, he'd be not, he would not be the first person you would go to for a reliable count of events. Um, but there's no one better suited to tell this story. Uh, and especially in that book, a lot you're questioning as to what's happening and what's really not happening. You know, in the film, it's a little bit less that characters sort of marginalized. Um, but even with Jack Nicholson, you know, he's being fed meds by, you know, crazy nurse Ratchet. And you don't necessarily know if everything that he's seeing is really there or not. Um, but what makes it such a brilliant book and film is, I think, for, you know, the audience to question um, what's real, what's not with it as well. Um, so the Mad Men, uh, you know, again, with the Picaro, it's, it's a great trope to use for a character, for an unreliable narrator. And I've, I've used the Mad Men before, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my own books at the end and how I use unreliable narrators. Um, which brings us to the third unreliable narrator. The third unreliable narrator is the naif. The naif is somebody whose abilities are um, impacted by basically inexperience or of age. Um, and a, a really great example of this is a more recent book, um, which was Room, if you've read it, by Emma Donahue. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. It was, again, made, I, I, I'm seeing a pattern where a lot of the books I choose were also made into really great films, because uh, that's my love as well. Um, but, you know, it was an amazing film where Brie Larson won Best Actress for it. Um, and what's so brilliant about Room is, um, unlike some of the characters on this list that I mentioned, um, the main character is a five-year-old, and his, unreliable, his unreliability is entirely unintentional. Not only is the narrator a child, a child is often sometimes an unreliable narrator. They're still grappling with what it means to be in this world. So they haven't 100% separated play from reality, imaginary from non-imaginary. Um, so that would be enough reason to question his credibility. But in addition to that, he's a child who spent his entire life trapped in a single room with his mother. You know, very her, um, harrowing story. He sees the televised images the outside world, but he believes them to be fiction. Um, he sleeps in the closet. He talks to the rug, um, which he calls rug. So everything literally is called what it is, desk, rug, mom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're talking about a, mass, a massively skewed perspective here. Um, and we hear the entire story um, in the language of grammar of uh, a very well-intentioned narrator, but um, ultimately an unreliable one because he's a severely confused five-year-old boy. Um, and even in the film, you get you know, all the elements of that as well. Um, you know, how much of a fantasy is he creating to avoid you know, what's basically happening where his, he and his mom have been kidnapped by a psychopath and she has to create this sort of um, you know, better reality for him than the reality that he's in. Uh, another example is uh, you know, super famous, Forrest Gump, which is a lot less famous as a book than it is as a film. Um, and in the book more so, um, you know, we have a character who age-wise um, is, is credible, but his inexperience with life for um, some of his uh, mental issues 
um, causes him to potentially be an unreliable narrator. He has tales of becoming a ping pong champion, a NASA astronaut. Some of these things are a little bit questionable, um, but it's his earnest unreliability um, due to a low IQ that allows the reader to forgive his possible embellishments. Um, we have also a character who's so likable and so lovable um, that we want to believe him. Um, and the matter of credibility really rests a lot more with the reader. Um, as a film, it really was made a, a bigger choice where the events really happen. I don't think anybody comes out of that movie questioning whether it happened or not. Um, and I think that was just a conscious decision just to make him a lot more of a connectable character. But in the book, we're not really sure 100%. And in some ways it makes the book a little bit more of an interesting take on a character like that. Um, so those are some examples of the naif. Um, the last uh, type of trope um, that is used for uh, an unreliable character narrator is uh, the liar. The liar is our most tricky of all unreliable uh, characters because we have no idea from start to finish um, whether obviously they're telling us the truth or not. Um, in addition to that, unlike some of the other characters like you know Jack, um, Forrest Gump, these are people who are well-intentioned and really want to be able to tell the truth. The liar is the opposite. The liar is set out to almost deceive us potentially from the start. Um, sometimes they're so enwrapped with their lies that they're really deceiving their self as well. And I'll get into that with our first liar. Um, our first liar is uh, probably from one of, my, one of my favorite books and films, which is uh, Fight Club uh, by Chuck Palahniuk, um, and, you know, the great film by David Fincher. Um, in Fight Club, our narrator Jack, he's plagued by insomnia, he's hooked on support groups, and he's keen to get his face bashed in during bare knuckle brawls. But none of that is really what makes him a classic example of an unreliable narrator. What makes him an unreliable narrator, and I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this, but it's been out for about 25 years, so I, yeah, I feel like it's okay. Um, but cover your ears if you don't wanna hear the spoiler. Um, what's brilliant about Fight Club is, um, the best friend in Fight Club, Tyler Durden, who gets Jack out of his shell and gets Jack to do all the things that his mild-mannered persona never could be, actually is Jack. Um, and he has a dual personality. And you don't really discover that until the very end. Um, what's brilliant about it happening at the end is if you actually went back, you know, especially with, with the film, you can notice all the details throughout that lead you to prove that the character is really a dual character in both. But I remember seeing it, and I, I think I was a teen when the film came out, uh, and it blew my mind because I had no idea that was happening. And it's a reason why it's a film that I return to again and again. The same with the book. You know, the, the book is, is it's a pretty faithful adaptation. The book you know, targets some kind of themes a little bit stronger, um, but the book as well, you know, really pulls the rug out from under you. Um, another perfect example, which is one of the, the biggest books, especially in the crime thriller community of the last decade and a half, which is Gone Girl um, by Gillian Flynn. Um, and again, you know, Gone Girl is the perfect liar. You know, when Amy Dunn takes on the role of the narrator halfway through Gone Girl, it comes off as a surprise. Uh, us readers, we've spent the first half of the book basically thinking she's dead, thanks to the novel's first unreliable narrator, which is her husband. Um, with both unreliable narrators, Amy and her husband, Nick, um, the author is doubling down on the novel's conflict and dismantles the whole story's moral compass. So we almost have no idea what's real and what's not, who we're supposed to side with, who we're supposed to hate, who's the hero, the heroine, who's the villain throughout the whole time. Um, and it's something that I had never really seen done prior to reading Gone Girl. Um, and again, it's another one where uh, the film gives a really faithful adaptation. Um, some of those characters, you know, I talked about um, Jack from, um, uh, Fight Club and Amy from Gone Girl, you can make a, a claim that they're mad men as well. Um, and oftentimes, like I said, when you're creating uh, unreliable, unreliable narrators, you want to think of well, what's the first characteristic I'm giving them, and then maybe I'm going to give them a sub characteristic too. So maybe they'll be a liar, but they'll also be a madman. Maybe they'll be a Picaro, but they're also a knave. 
Um, this is basically what happens with the, uh, a book like Gone Girl, where it doubles down on the conflict and the shocking value of it um, and makes it that much more engaging and intriguing for the readers as well. Um, so those are some examples of different types of unreliable narrators. Uh, now let's talk about different ways to create an unreliable narrator. Um, so when you're creating an unreliable narrator, you want to feed readers misinformation throughout the source that they trust the most in the story. It's a satisfying way to add twists and turns in narrative. And most importantly, with any type of book, whether it's a thriller or not a thriller, to add suspense and tension, which is really the two most important characteristics, I think, in creating a novel, even if it's like just purely like a literary work. Um, so these are some of the tips that, that, that I have for incorporating an unreliable narrator into the story. Um, so one of them, and really the first two that I'm gonna give, they are disparate. So you could make an argument that you're only gonna keep one of them in it. Um, so one element would be keeping a reader in the dark. Um, this is an example uh, like I had with Fight Club where we really don't know up until the very end if Jack is also Tyler Durden, if he has a dual personality. Um, and with this, readers are used to having more information than the characters. Normally when we read, you know, I talked before about sort of locking into a contract between author and reader. We expect that the author is going to be the one to guide us perfectly through the story, almost taking us by the hand. Um, so this is flipping that on its head and keeping the reader in the dark in mu as much as possible. You have your narrator withhold certain information from your reader um, to see as much as possible how it impacts the story. Something I'm going to talk about a little bit later um, we're going to go into the difference of um, outlining versus being a pantser. And even in discussion, we could talk about sort of which types of writers we are. Uh, when you're creating an unreliable narrator, though, I think it's very difficult to do it by the seat of your pants. Um, a lot of these books, and I'm sure if you spoke to the authors about it, were so outlined from start to finish because they had to hit the right beats at the right time to prove um, you know, when everything is being flipped on its head, like I said. So definitely if you're keeping your reader in the dark, this is like a third act twist that's gonna happen where you show that the reader has been unreliable all along. You really need to make sure enough of it is plotted and enough of it, all the beats are hitting before. Um, so we as readers aren't so thrown off by it that we basically take the book and we just throw it across the room and we want to have nothing to do with it anymore. We don't want that reaction. Well, you could have that reaction for the first second, but then if, the, if somebody wants to pick it up, they're like, what's this? And they throw it, but then they run to it and they pick it up and they're like, okay, now I really want to figure out why. That's okay. But you don't want them to throw the book and then that's the end of it. Uh, so that's one example, keeping your reader in the dark as much as possible. Um, having something different than that would be having an unreliable narrator from the start. This is more of like the contract between the reader and the author that I would say. It's almost the author saying, yes, this character is completely unreliable. Um, we're, gonna, we're knowing this throughout the start. There's going to be no question about that. Trust what he says or what she says, you know, at a bare minimum. Um, and this way, the reader basically feels comfortable. Um, and this goes a lot uh, along the line of what I was saying before about memory. You know, we as people were un inherently unreliable when we tell a story. Our stories are filtered through our experience, our beliefs, all of these other things that come along with it, then when the story actually starts. So, in this aspect, the narrator just doesn't become unreliable. We hinted all these qualities throughout. We almost saw, you know, as an author, you would like salt and pepper it throughout um, that might compromise them in their story early on. Um, and in doing this, you're planting the seeds of doubt as early as possible. So those are sort of two different ways at the start you could kind of deal with an unreliable narrator. Um, I'm not sure if you could do both in the same one. Mm, I would have to think about that. It's almost like make a choice between the two. Um, another good example is to let other characters be a sounding board. You have an unreliable character, a narrator, let's say, and you're not necessarily showing that that character is unreliable because, again, we never want to show in a book, you know, necessarily. We want, um, you know, our, our, our writing to kind of come through without telling the reader exactly what's happening. Um, so you could do this if other characters are basically questioning their beliefs. So if you have a character saying something, and then you have another character in a dialogue with them wondering what's going on, 
here and there, already now the doubts are kind of filtering in a reader's mind. Um, another good example of this in a slightly different way would be uh, William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, you know, classic, um, amazing novel, which I believe he wrote in like eight weeks, which is just insane. Um, and in As I Lay Dying, each chapter is a different character. And there's about 15 first person narrators throughout. So we have a tragedy that happens and we have 15 different people reflecting on that different types of tragedy. You know, like any scenario, obviously if something happens and there's 15 different witnesses, you have 15 different elements of what the truth actually is. You have the truth and then you have everybody else's opinion of what the truth is. Um, and oftentimes when this happens, the stories don't align. Every character's interpretation of the events is filtered through their own lens, um, how they feel about the tragedy, how they feel about who the tragedy happened to, how they feel about all of those people around them as well. Um, now, that's a really difficult thing to do. I would say, you know, if you're a budding writer, um, do not start writing a book with 15 different narrators. <laughs> that's something I think you really need to work towards as a writer. Um, but if you feel sort of the comfortability, and again, the story is pushing you in that direction where that's the story that needs to be told, um, use the, all those other characters to reflect all those inconsistencies in your narrator's story. Um, another good example is adding a pinch of unreliability. So it's a little bit like we were talking about before, where you, you don't want to just knock somebody over the head with, yes, this character is unreliable. That's not going to work for the type of book you're doing. You want to just sprinkle little seeds of doubt here and there. So a very astute reader might pick up on it and be like, something is a little off. I can't put my finger on it, but something's not quite adding up. Um, and again, this is a character that's not as off the wall crazy as like Patrick Bateman in American Psycho, where we see right off the bat, something's not gelling. Um, these are where you want a character that has varying degrees of unreliability, which can create really interesting and multidimensional characters. Um, there's one of the Harry Potter books, which is my favorite Harry Potter, which is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, um, where Harry Potter occasionally gives the reader information simply because it's what he believes. He spends most of the book running from an escaped prisoner he thinks killed his parents, only to find out what, it was a lie. So through the whole time we're with him and we're kind of in the same time frame as he figuring out what's going on. Even though our main character is well-intentioned, we're giving them some unreliable moments to make them slightly flawed and thus more believable. And again, in, in a series like Harry Potter, you know, we believed him for the first two books. He's the hero of the story. You know, we want to believe him as much as possible. So those little elements of... Um, unreliability are almost okay in a series like that. Another really good example is adding an unpredictable act. Um, when a thoughtful, responsible, or otherwise dependable character suddenly does something highly questionable, all of a sudden they become obviously unreliable. You know, imagine that your previously predictable neighbor known for mowing the lawn every Saturday, all of a sudden lights it on fire instead we're gonna kind of take a step back and be like, something might be off about this person. Um, in real life, this would forever change the way we saw about them. And it would also make us eye them carefully every time you know, we went to get our mail. Um, but it would make us question, what are they truly capable of? You know, Who could even say? This would be an example of almost like that third act twist that you were doing. We're with this character for two thirds of the novel. They're mild mannered. Um, and then all of a sudden something just kind of sets them off. And now, okay, we're not quite as um, in their, you know, believability realm. Um, and it, you know, it goes along, let's say you're creating a, you know, a thriller, a murder mystery. Whenever somebody's being interviewed, what's the first thing that somebody says about the neighbor? Oh, they were mild mannered. They were so polite. They were great. Then maybe there was one instance that made them kind of think twice. Um, so that's a good kind of uh, thing to use for, for that. Another good trope is uh, muddying the motivations. If you provide your narrators with enough of conflicting desires and different drives, you're keeping the reader kind of constantly guessing about what their true mindset is. Then when the motives shift, so does the ground under the reader's feet. Um, and often this happens in fiction, you know, an erratic move on the part of your narrator 
will handily unnerve your reader as well. Um, so you're always kind of keeping them guessing as much as possible. And this goes a little bit more along the lines of what I was saying before, where you're doing a little more work, both as the author and as um, the reader of an unreliable narrator book. You know, as the author, again, you're really figuring out all those exact instances where you're peppering the seeds of doubt. Um, and as a reader, your antenna's up a little bit more as to whether you could trust this person going forward is not or not. Um, a final thing I would say would be to keep things as believable as possible. Um, this goes along with fiction in general. You know, nothing works in fiction unless you're you're you know believing it as a reader. Um, you have to believe the characters' actions. The actions have to be grounded in some type of believability, even if it's going into a surreal, you know, fear and loathing territory kind of um, you know space. Um, so when you strain your be believability, you still have to focus on some type of reality as much as possible. Um, so these are some kind of uh, things that I've used um, and that I've heard that other authors have used. Um, I haven't looked at sort of all the, the questions in the chat, but at, at the end, we'll sort of go through them kind of one by one. I think it's just easier to do it that way. Um, but yes, if I missed anything, please type it there and, and, and I'll go right to it. Um, but these are some of the things that I've used uh, for, for my own um, unreliable narrators. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, something I mentioned before, and it was whether you're an outline or a pantser. This is uh, uh, terms that are, are, are brought up a lot in the writing community. Um, and for those that don't really know what it means is there's really two types of writers, outline and, by, and pantsers. Those who created a detailed roadmap and those who basically fly by the seat of their pants. Oftentimes writers are one or the other. I've written books both. My earlier books, I tended to be more of a pantser and now it's more time constraints where I, I almost don't have as many years as I wanna put into a book. Um, I wanna just write that book. So it's easier for me to write an outline. Also a lot of my works I'm thinking about in a film or TV scenario as well. So to have an outline and a structure already, it helps me if I'm then writing the script or the TV pilot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you're creating unreliable narrators, and I had mentioned this before, it really helps to outline. And it's again, because so many things have to happen at the right time, that if you're flying by the seat of your pants, um, I would say you're putting extra work almost on yourself because ultimately you're gonna constantly have to go back to edit and edit and edit and make sure that you're really giving the readers everything at the right time that it needs to happen. Um, and in addition to this, it's a little bit what I was talking before about Fight Club. You wanna make sure that if a reader picked up your book again, they're seeing all the clues um, revealing the narrator from the start. Um, there's a film that I could use as sort of a perfect example for it, which is a great film, um, The Sixth Sense, an M. Night Shyamalan film. You know, and again, if you have not seen it, cover your ears because I'm about to give the spoiler, but it's, a, it's also a 20 plus year movie. So, you know, if you haven't gotten to it yet, I feel like it was, you know, you missed your shot. Um, in the film, The Sixth Sense, it's a classic, classic, unreliable narrator. Technically, he's a naif because he's not of age, the Bruce Willis character, but he's inexperienced. Um, and what he doesn't realize is that he's a ghost the entire film. Um, he thinks he's a detective and everything that's happening is actually happening, um, where in reality, um, nobody sees him except for the Haley Joel Osment character, because as he states in the film's tagline, he could see ghosts. Um, and this is a, similar to Fight Club, where about two thirds, three quarters through the movie, there's the realization and ultimately, you are with the character in discovering who they are um, and the shock of it. Uh, I remember again seeing it. I did not see that twist coming. Like most people, I think who saw it early on, and then you knew a twist was happening. So maybe you're kind of looking out for it a little bit. Um, but what's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant about that film and what keeps it being a rewatch is it literally sets up and has so many moments that proves that Bruce Willis is a ghost throughout. Um, and it's almost more fun to rewatch it, knowing it, because you're seeing all of those beats and how brilliantly it was done by M. Night Shyamalan throughout it. You know, later on in, in that director's career, we expect a twist out of all of his, you know, things. I just saw his last one old and like, I knew a twist was coming with it. So it, it blunts it a little bit. 
And it's something I, I actually just realized this now, you know, if you're, if you're a writer who's always creating an unreliable narrator, um, the problem with something like that is readers are really smart and they're going to pick up on that. And it might blunt some of your future works because they'll ultimately realize every time, especially if it's like the third act twist and everything, which a little bit has happened with um, M. Night Shyamalan's career where, you know, we go into the movie expecting the twist. And so our brains are that much more, um, you know, engaged to notice and figure out what that twist is. And it lessens it a little bit, you know, you never want to be almost like a gimmick, I would say, as a writer. And that being said, he's super successful and like who wouldn't take his career. So, I mean, I really can't talk. Um, but in terms of, like I said, thinking about, um, you know, when you're creating an unreliable narrator, if it's something you enjoy doing in a book, you know, maybe change it up as much as possible. So on one hand, you know, right off the bat, on another hand, it's more of a twist. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, my own work and how I've used unreliable narrators in that. Um, I published eight novels, and in looking back, I sort of realized that pretty much most of them had unreliable narrators, um, and definitely about five of them um, have unreliable narrators. So uh, the first one I wanted to talk about was my novel, The Mentor. Um, the Mentor, um, it's a classic cat and mouse thriller. Um, it's about a book editor and a, ma and a writer whose masterpiece gets rejected by that editor. Um, they've known each other forever. He was his college professor when the book editor was in school. So when they meet up again in life, he's so excited to read this book. Um, and he reads it and he realizes it's absolutely the worst thing ever written and really, 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 really disturbing. And slowly reminds the editor that of this cold case from when the editor and the mentor was were in college together and this girl he dated went missing. So he starts to think, well, maybe the mentor had something to do with this. Then when he won't publish his book, um, he kind of cape fears him. So he goes all out crazy on him. So that's a classic example of a madman. But what I did in that book that made it a little more interesting um, was you don't know, as the editor sort of goes through the journey with the crazy mentor, the editor starts to lose some of his sanity as well. And he starts to wonder whether he might have had something to do with that initial cold case that happened too, because he was on drugs at the time, and he was in a really bad place, and he has holes in his memory of it. And more and more, the mentor starts filling in those holes potentially falsely, potentially truthfully, and starts playing with his mind more and more. So you almost begin right away with thinking that the mentor is the crazy one and the editor is the hero and slowly they start to converge and then switch in it. Um, so that was a book that I really, really, really had to outline. Um, I would say about 80 to 90% of it um, wound up sticking in, in, in the final. Um, and it was really because I had to have the exact moments throughout where you're on one side, when you're moving to the other side in terms of the characters, um, and that if somebody actually read it again, they would then notice all the right beats throughout that proves 100%, you know, um, ultimately how they believe the novel to be and who they think is the hero and who is the villain. Um, so that's, I would say, my class, the, the most example of a madman, um, but also potentially a naif because the character is a little unsure of his own um, circumstances as to what happened um, from you know, 20 years prior. Um, another e example from one of my books, it's my most recent book, um, it's called Stalker Stalked, um, which um, as a pitch of all books, I think is the easiest one. It's basically about a stalker who gets stalked um, and it's the epitome of an unreliable narrator. This one also is in first person. Uh, the mentor was in third person. Oftentimes when we think of unreliable narrators, we go to, it has to be first person, but you can make an argument that there could be unreliable narrators in third person stories as well and equally done just, ju just as well. Um, Stalker Stock though is first person. Our main character, Lexi, she admits right off the bat, she's a stalker with a penchant for alcohol and pills that fog her mind. So we know right away she may not be entirely, not only telling the truth, but what she's seeing before her might not actually be the reality of what's happening. 
Um, the twist in the book happens when somebody starts stalking her as well. Readers don't know if that aspect is all in her mind or if she's truly being in pursuit. So we feel her fear, but is her fear really based on somebody after her or is the fear based on all the different crazy that's clouding her mind as much as possible? Um, what's difficult with a character like that is she's not very likable. Um, sometimes those kind of cross over where we have unreliable characters who are also un unlikable. And it's something that a little bit bugs me about the publishing industry because I feel like there's this tend to where all characters have to be likable, where there's somebody we want to be our best friend or that we fall in love with. And what I dislike about that is that that's just very unrealistic. You know, in, in a sea of a population of billions of people, you're really not gonna like everybody. And that's really just a reality. And I find sometimes it's more interesting when you're dealing with characters that are a little unlikable, especially if they go on enough of a hero's journey. You know, a hero's journey, a character begins at one stage and ultimately, goes to a better stage in terms of what we think of them as a person. Um, sometimes, you know, it's herky-jerky, um, but oftentimes they, they better themselves. And you know, a character like Lexi in Stalker Stock, we really dislike her so much from the beginning that she has nowhere to go but up. Um, and ultimately, you know, not giving too much spoilers away, um, she becomes less of an unreliable person because she starts to love herself that much more that she loses the alcohol, she loses the drugs, um, and in doing so really loses the, the stalker after her as well. Um, the next one in my books that, that uh, example, um, this one's a Picaro, that's Slow Down. Um, this was my first book. Um, I wrote the book when I was uh, 23 and then put it in the desk for eight years. And then when my agent was like, oh, what else do you have? I was like, well, I have this book that I wrote when I was 23. Nothing had sold yet. We really were at this stage where it was like, is this career going to happen? And I gave it to him and he really loved it. Um, the writing was pretty awful, but um, the outline and the plot was all there. Uh, so I really was able to kind of, you know, shape it. And that became my first book and, you know, kind of started everything. Uh, so I always have like a, like a first love with it. Um, and I think oftentimes for a first book, um, a Picaro as an unreliable narrator is a really good choice to do. Again, it's a narrator that's not 100% unreliable. They're not really setting out to deceive you. It's somebody that's been pulled out of their circumstance. And because of that, they're still, you know, finding their own feet in this new world. And in doing so, things tend to get exaggerated, et cetera. Um, so in, in Slow Down, our first person narrator, um, right off the bat, you know he's, he's rich and he's a morally bankrupt person. Um, he's jealous towards the director of uh, a, a famous indie film, and it reaches a full tilt when the director starts a relationship with the love of Noah's life, Nevi, who he's never been able to um, actually move out of a friend zone with. Um, when Dominic's wife comes along and hatches a plot to get rid of Dominic, uh, Noah jumps on board right away. We know from the start that he has weak morals um, and can easily get rid of Dominic to get what he desires, but he's pulled out of this sort of silver spoon world that he's in and he's thrust into this new Hollywood world. And in doing so, he's not, he doesn't have sort of, um, he's not adored like he was in the world that he had come from. So he almost has to start anew. Um, and in doing so, uh, he's that example of a Picaro because he's kind of, you know, finding his feet as we're finding him. And most of what he's saying is true, um, but he's a character that has the, you know, penchant to exaggerate and also slide into a moral bankrupt uh, territory. Um, my other novel, uh, The Ancestor, I think is the most unreliable of, of all my books and actually probably my favorite of all of them. Um, the Ancestor is about a character named Wyatt. He wakes up in the Alaskan wilderness with amnesia. He has no idea who he is. Um, throughout the novel, he slowly gets memories of the Alaskan gold rush and he starts to believe he was a prospector from that era who magically had been frozen in time and suddenly awakens. Um, when he awakens, he sees a man who looks exactly like him. 
follows the man home, um, sees the man's family. And that's when the memories start to kind of resurface of his own family. So he really starts to believe that this man and his, is his great, great grandson. Um, and in getting close with him, he could get a, a, a bigger clue into his past and who he was and maybe solve the mystery of, you know, what caused him to be um, on ice. Um, the, the, the sort of trick in, in it is that as he's remembering more of his past, he remembers some really terrible things he did. As an Alaskan prospector, it was a very different time than the California gold rush. It really was a lot more of a cutthroat adventure kind of um, error. And he had to get rid of some people to kind of move ahead and, and ultimately get the gold at the end before he was potentially frozen in time. So you have a character that will do really anything to um, go back to who he was. And he believes if he steals this family from um, the man who looks like him, that's his best shot at regaining all of his memories. Um, but at the same time, you have a character who's a little bit of a madman. You have a character who's a little bit of a naif as well. Um, you also have a character who's somewhat of a Picaro because he's pulled out of who he was and thrust into something else. And you have a character also who's a liar because he'll do whatever it takes to really get what he wants at the end. So it's, it's, a, it's a book that really kind of crosses all the different um, unreliable things. Um, and the last one I'll talk about, which um, is sort of borderline, but it's my novel, Orange City. Um, it's my only sci-fi novel and it's a, it's a dystopian novel. And it's about uh, a man named Graham who's sent to a city that may or may not exist in this world. Um, what makes him unreliable is he's a naif. He doesn't really know anything about this city. So the readers are discovering things as he's discovering them. Um, and because he really doesn't know of anything around him, you can't quite tell if what's happening is real or it's not. Um, as the book progresses, you also find out that the leader of the city is somewhat drugging him a little bit throughout in the form of these like weird sodas. Um, so he's not only a naif, he's also a little bit of a, of a character um, who's a Picaro as well, who's been pulled out of his circumstances. Um, so the last thing I, I wanted to mention before we jump to a discussion um, is just some other great books and films with an unreliable narrator. And then I was going to end with uh, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books. Um, so some other really great uh, books and films as well to kind of check out for unreliable narrators. Um, Catcher in the Rye, um, Under the Net by Iris Murdoch, uh, Nabokov's Lolita, um, two William Faulkner books, The Sound and the Fury and As I Lay Dying. Um, brilliant, brilliant film, Usual Suspects. Um, the Silver Linings Playbook, um, both the book and the film are really good examples. Um, Beautiful Mind, uh, the Russell Crowe, or you could read the nonfiction book as well about, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head. Um, Sixth Sense, like I mentioned before. Uh, Shutter Island with Leonardo DiCaprio is a great example. Uh, we Need to Talk About Kevin. Um, Notes on a Scandal, which also uh, was a book made into a great film. Um, really, really great book, uh, The Curious Incident in the Dog of Nighttime, um, the classic book, The Good Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford, and the last one, um, Ian McEwan's um, Atonement. Um, and then the last thing I'll end with a quote, um, and this is from uh, Holden Caulfield. Holden Caulfield uh, tells uh, the readers in Catcher in the Rye, you know, pretty much from jump, um, I'm the most terrific liar you ever saw in your life. It's awful. If I'm on my way to the store to buy a magazine, even, and somebody asks me where I'm going, I'm liable to say I'm going to the opera. It's terrible. So right off the bat, how can we even believe anything he says? Um, so let's use that as a jumping point for a, a discussion. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this little mini lecture about unreliable narrators. That was, that was great, um, Lee. Thanks. And as you, as you were going through there, I could actually picture movies and books that feature the types of awesome. Uh, awesome. unreliable narrators you're talking about. Okay, so let's go through some of these questions. Yeah. Brian yeah. says, um, so the narrator is another term for the main protagonist, the person from whose POV we see what's going on. Those are questions. Sounds like you can have more than one. I always think of a narrator as the author's telling the story rather than showing what's happening. Hmm. So I guess she's got a little confusion there. Um, just repeat that for me one time. I'm sorry. Okay, so the narrator is another. Mm -hmm. So the narrator is another term for the protagonist. Yes, yes, okay. yes. The mm -hmm. person from whose POV we see what's going on. Sounds like you can have more than one. Is that true? Can you have more than one um, narrator? 
Um, yeah, so, can, they, but can they all be unreliable? Yeah, so an example I gave of that was um, William Faulkner's As They Lay Dying, when there's basically 15 different narrators. Each chapter is a different narrator telling the story of what's happening. Um, and again, it's a really hard thing to do. Um, I think you know a, a very seasoned writer, almost kind of pulling out of their comfort zone, might want to try it. But I think it's a tough thing to do, you know, if, if you're getting your feet wet in terms of writing books as well. Um, but yeah, the narrator is basically your protagonist, the, he, the, the hero of the story, maybe they're the anti-hero of the story, um, but they're the one telling everything that's happening. Um, a lot of times, you know, POV, I think, is, is it's the most difficult thing to do in a book and to get it right, um, especially if it's not just a first person uh, narration. A lot of times authors for their first book, you write a first person narrated story. And I think it's easy. We speak in first person, I, 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 I. So it's very easy to kind of make that leap and then jump to that being your character. My, excuse me, my first book was in first person. And then when we kind of, you know, get a little bit more of a grounding in terms of writer, you could try third person. With third person, there's often, you know, two types. It's a very close third person, close third person, we're seeing the eyes through the character, um, but that character is not I, it's he, she, it, they, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other type of third person is when it's more of an omni, like war and peace, where it's an omniscient narrative just telling this giant story, basically. Um, and that's very, very difficult to do. I actually don't think I've ever fully done that in a book. Um, and maybe it's just because I'm not writing war and peace or anything like that. But I find it's a lot more comfortable to do close third. And if you do close third, a really good way of kind of shifting the narration um, is, you know, a different chapter is a different character's perspective, or, you know, you have a, a like a break where there's like a, a line break or something, and then a new character kind of comes into the POV. If you don't have that, it's very confusing for a reader, and it's really hard to do. The last book I remember that did it um, was the book that got um, right before COVID, all of the good press, bad press, that book, American Dirt. Um, and it flipped POVs paragraph by paragraph by paragraph sometimes. And while it did it kind of well, it was really, really confusing at times. And it takes you away when you're in a character's shoes and you're feeling for them. And then the next paragraph, you have to feel for another character, and another character, another character. Another. So I, I felt kind of jumped around a little too much. And, you know, beyond all the other issues that people have with that book, um, that, that was actually my, you know, biggest difficulty. So if you're really doing, you know, where it's, it's a POV shift, um, the best thing to do is to have sort of breaks so the reader knows what's happening. Yeah. Okay, great. And this is from Larry. Do you recommend the reveal in clues or in a single big reveal? Um, you know, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And he says, could you comment on Gone Girl, where um, uh, Gillian Flynn, Gillian Flynn, had the character become the narrator halfway through? Yeah, so I, you know, I think it's a conscious choice you have to make from the start. You know, are you writing a book where you know the character is unreliable right from the start? Like the quote I gave for Catch on the Rye, you, you know, and again, you know, the twist of Catch on the Rye is he winds up in a mental institution. You know, that's the sort of big, the big twist in it. Um, so there you have actually a character that, you know, you know is unreliable from the start, but then there's an extra kind of twist at the end that makes them super unreliable. Um, you know, with Gone Girl, Gone Girl is one of the most complex because you have really two unreliable narrators. You have two different perspectives of what happened. You have uh, somebody you think is dead that then is not dead. You have uh, a her uh, somebody who's a villain that becomes a heroine. So there's all of these different twists and turns happening throughout. It, I haven't read that book recently, so I would have to go back and like look where all the twists happen. But I believe it's sort of like as you're moving to the second half of it that there's the flip and then the antenna starts to go up as the reader. Um, I, I think it takes about 40% of that book before you realize that something's off. Because I remember re reading it at first and being like, she is terrible. Like, you hate her. And then it flips and you're like, oh, I hate him. And she's the one, you know, she's the heroine in it. And it changes your whole dynamic and perspective of it. So I think that's why it became such a huge huge hit and success because it's such a difficult thing to pull off. And, you know, she pulls it off really brilliantly. Yeah. Okay. And um, also who doesn't love to be manipulated? Okay. So um, Diana says, do those same categories of unreliable narrators apply to secondary characters? 
like a character that the narrator protagonist begins to suspect is not being truthful? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I, I hadn't thought about that, but that's so true, especially if you're writing a mystery. You know, sometimes in a mystery, the secondary character is the killer. So, you know, you don't want to give that away right off the bat. Um, so then that big character becomes um, unreliable. You know, maybe they're the best friend and that's why they're that close to the narrator. And then all of a sudden the narrator starts seeing kind of things that are off about them. Um, if you have it where it's, you know, first person and it's switching, um, the trick is to do that. You know, you don't want to ever, you don't want your readers ever to feel like they're cheated. I think that's the biggest, you know, detriment you could do. So it'd be really cheating kind of to have like three quarters of a novel where there's one narrator and then all of a sudden at the end you switch and it's the other person and the reveal is that person's the killer. You know, I mean, it's a way to do it, but there's probably more interesting and less kind of um, deceiving ways to do that. You know, it, it, you want to kind of toe the line between, you know, deceiving the reader, but not losing their trust as much as possible. And like I said before, where somebody throws the book across the room and then doesn't pick it up. You don't want that. Okay. And then Catherine asked, was Six Sense ever a novel or could it be? Six Sense was not a novel. It was an original script. Um, it totally could be a novel. It's very rare, I think, for a film to then become a book. Um, and I don't believe M. Night Shyamalan has ever written a book before. Um, oh, I know an example of that that I just read, um, Quentin Tarantino's last film, which is not an unreliable narrator, but um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, it was a film. And then about a year later, he had been writing it as a book the whole time and he released it as a book. Um, so you never know, I guess. Interesting, okay. And then, um... Okay, so oh, look, it's a question for me. Um, is it more important to want your reader to trust, like, or be able to relate to an unreliable character? Is that for you to answer? From, from no, me? no, from, from me to you. Oh, from, from you, oh, okay. <laughs> now, I would never want to answer that question. So, <laughs> so you said, it, is it more important to trust? Trust, what like, or be able to relate. If you're creating a character, um, it, or is there some combination or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, there's an element where, you, you know, you have to trust the character, you know, if, if you lose the trust completely, um, I think sometimes you could lose the reader and, and the trust doesn't mean like, oh, this person's a liar. It's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this character anymore. So I think that's where you're getting into like the likability factor of it. And, you know, sometimes that's really just the reader itself. Like I've had people like my unlikable characters because they're unlikable. And like I had a lady on Goodreads like thought I was basically the devil because of one of my characters. I mean, on another level, just hated this person to such an extent. My response was like, sometimes the things we hate so much we actually love, but you know, that, that's a whole separate thing. Um, so I think, you know, like you said, I think you wanna have a good mix. I think, you know, if you have an unlikable character um, and this would be a whole separate, you know, lecture basically, but the key to making an unlikable character is to putting little bits of likability and little bits of relatability into that character as much as possible. You know, my first book, Slow Down, I, I always describe it as like horrible people doing horrible things to one another. Um, but the main character, when I would want to make him relatable, I would give like a truthful element of myself or something from my past and I would put that in. So like I used to, this is weird, but like I used to have this imaginary friend when I was a little kid and his name was Little Bodhi and Little Bodhi would only come once a week. It was like the only, I didn't have patience for him all week. It was like once a week you can come and Little Bodhi would come. And it, it, it was an element that I gave to my character that just made him endearing. You know, it, it made him funny. It was a funny little antidote. Um, and it was a likability aspect even when he's doing sort of horrendous things, we're kind of thinking about, oh, there was that imaginary character that you like. So like things like that, you want to add as much as possible. And you really don't want to lose the trust with the reader too. So and I can, I'm going to ask a follow up on the unlikable characters. Mm -hmm. Do they have to be likable by the end? Like in um, as good as it gets, um, do they have to have some sort of transformational arc where they change or can they still be as unlikable at the end as they are in the beginning? It's well, I think it's a twofold question. I think in terms of sellability versus actuality, um, I, I, I think you can make the argument. If you're pitching it to editors, your agents pitching it to editors, um, they wanna see that arc. 
you know, so a character that starts off unlikable, yeah, good as it gets, perfect, perfect thing, you know, he, we're annoyed with him, we hate him, we hate him, oh my god, all of a sudden we kind of love him, and he's endearing, and he's great, and we root for him, um, so, you know, setting out, you want to do that, um, with my book, The Ancestor, and it's why it, it, it didn't sell to a, a big publisher, it's why uh, only an indie publisher, um, the character that I spoke about, Wyatt, you know, he has amnesia, he begins here, we like him, we realize he did some terrible things, he does some terrible things, and at the end, he does the most terrible thing, so he kind of goes like this a little bit throughout, but we loved him so much for so much of the book that I would hope we're still in his corner, I'm, I'm still in this corner, and the interesting thing is, he justifies everything he does. So in his mind, he's not being horrible. But we had a really big editor that would have been like career changing for me, Random Penguin, um, and was just like, I can't do that ending. I, I know that that ending is what had to happen for the book, but for the marketing team, for everybody else, we can't have that ending. And I was just like, there's nothing we could do, you know, I, A, it really meant he wasn't going to buy the book, um, but it also was like, that was how the book had to end, so again, I think it's a twofold question, sometimes it's like, you know, how much do you want to tell exactly the story you want to tell, and how much do you want the marketing team to get involved and tell you the story that they want to tell? The committee, um, okay, um, so Catherine wants to know, which is your favorite of your books? Um, I think the ancestor is 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 by far my favorite. Um, it's the deepest. It's historical, which I had never written before. Um, it was written at a very. My father had passed away around the time I was writing it, so it was written at a very sort of you know tough time in my own life. Um, and it's really a book like dedicated to him. And I wouldn't have been able to write it without going through that. So it was like my therapy for that time in my life. Um, and it's a really special book. And I, I have sort of bigger designs for it. I have a sequel in mind. I'm slowly working on it as a TV series. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot more that can come out of it than, than just the book now. Okay, um, let's see. Sherry says, brilliant, knowledgeable presentation. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Deborah says, great talk. The Life of Pi has an interesting twist at the end too, which mm -hmm. um, calls the whole rest of the story into question. Yeah, that's a good one. I when I was doing some research uh, about um, that was when it came up, but I had read it so long ago that I had forgotten the actual end. So I, I didn't want to include that. But um, yeah, that's it. Well, how does it end if, if they if they don't mind me asking again? Um, maybe um, I, I can I can I can answer that. He lands yeah. in South America mm -hmm. and he gets rescued. And then when they interview him, he comes up with a completely different story. Oh, right, of right, what right. happened? Right, 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 right. And you realize it was what he needed to right. have in his mind to survive. Right, right, right. exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's really. I mean, yeah, that I feel like I read that book probably when it came out, so it was about twenty years old. And I sometimes have a really bad habit with books where it's like they go in one ear and then they just fall out. Um, but yeah, it's brilliant. That one I actually haven't seen the film of, but I've heard the film is really beautiful as well. The Ang Lee mm -hmm. film. Yeah, and um, Sherry had some other uh, examples too. I think every right. as you're talking, everybody's uh, remembering how many of their favorite books have unreliable narrators in them. Yeah. So um, the Thirteenth Tale, Gentlemen and Players, Chris Bohalian's The Double Blind made me reread oh, The Great Gatsby. The double, the double Blind is a perfect example. I love that book. That's a perfect example. Yeah, and um, Karen says Dan Brown withheld information to build suspense in the Da Vinci Code. I felt manipulated, but it obviously worked for me. I felt like and it, it felt like an untrustworthy narrator rather than unreliable. Or correction, it, it obviously worked for him and not for her. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that book is such like an action, things have to happen type of book um, that, yeah, I, I lost my train of thought on that one. I'm trying to remember <laughs> that. I'm like, oh my God, I, I've completely forgotten that book. Um, although I remember reading it and wanting to like do all the research about everything he talked about. And look, what did it sell? Like 80 million copies. I mean, he did something right. Damn Brown. There, there's a moral in there somewhere. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Janice says, that's why I didn't like Gone Girl. They were both as terrible at the end as they were at the beginning. A lot of people felt that way, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, it, 
it, it, it's how I, it's something where I actually enjoy that. I don't always need a character to like to become like as good as it gets at the end. I, I sometimes like when when the twist is that they're both horrible people and like that's it. Um, and you know, Gone Girl, like they're doing so many terrible things to each other throughout that yeah, it's really hard to to get behind and root for one of them, honestly, which is I think part of its brilliance too. I like twisted weird. So, you know, David Lynch is my favorite type of you know, a tour. So I like when things kind of blur the line of, you know, morals and ethics and acceptability. Yeah, that, that they say, you know, the antagonist is the hero of their story. I guess if you can convince everybody that they're the hero, the, the reader's like, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I have to turn the page. So Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, abs absolutely. I saw somebody else, I, I heard, I, I just looked, um, which type of what for girl on the train would they fall into yeah um that's an interesting one because i think it hits a bunch of different ones you know she's mad she's a mad person in some ways in some ways she's a little bit of a picaro because she's pulled out of her circumstance into this whole other world as well um where she has to kind of get her feet wet um you know her faculties she doesn't have and she's a bit of a liar too so she really hits she kind of checks all those boxes. You know, some of these now thinking about it, the ones that were the biggest hits are the ones that really check all the boxes when they're doing it. So, and I, just to finish off uh, this discussion on the truth, you know, everybody has, um, there is the truth and then mm -hmm. everybody has their truth, mm -hmm. um, their own truth. So how, how does that um, square with unreliable narrators? Are all narrators unreliable or is there some, aspect of the truth being um, itself and pure? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I a little bit touched on it at the beginning that, you know, we're all unreliable narrators of our own story completely. Um, but there is somewhat of a contract when you're opening a book that you're putting your faith into whoever's telling the story. And the most important thing, you know, as a writer is, you know, why is this story being told? And why is the story being told when it's being told? So why are we being included onto this moment of the story's life? Um, you know, and in, 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 in doing so, um, you know, you want to have faith that that story is being told in the best way possible. The trick is, obviously, if the book, if the purpose of the book is about its unreliability, you know, then there's no holds barred, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want. And the really great thing about novel writing, more so even than like screenwriting, is there's no one right way to do anything. You know, a, a screenplay, you have an hour and a half to tell it. Everything has to happen at really kind of the right time for it to work. Um, you know, a novel could be 200 pages, it could be 1,000 pages. So it's really up to you as to like, what's the best way that you could tell this story and why are you telling the story when you're telling that story and in terms of that however you want to make it unreliable and untruthful and throw in the shocks and all these other things that we talked about um, is entirely up to you whether you're outlining it whether you're pantsing it um, you know it's you have the power you're the god in in, in creating it all right great well thank you so much lee this has been fantastic Thank you. Uh, we're gonna give you an SCWA round of applause. Oh, thank you so much. I was really nervous going into it, so I'm glad. It, I, I I was a professor for ten years, but I haven't for all of COVID, so like I felt like a little out of practice. So yeah, this was really great. It made me feel like comfortable, you know, with it again. Well, you you haven't lost it. So uh, <laughs> all right, and and best of luck on everything that's um, that you have going on. Um, cool. Please please let us know. We uh, we're now yeah. all invested in your success so yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Sincerely. Anytime, anytime you need another lecture i'm down and you know maybe i'm hoping to get to california in the near future so maybe well, if, if you do anytime let us know okay All right. no thank, yeah. thank you so much and thank you everybody for being here have a good month and we'll see yeah. you soon keep writing stay safe